anyway, at Villanova, we've been doing a lot of research for I guess about 15 years now on stormwater issues. Uh, we very clearly saw that things were changing and we wanted to get in front of it, and we've been using the campus as a test bed for activities. Uh, we have a lot of partners to help uh, fund us. We've also been working at NC State and University of Maryland and Temple in some areas. And uh, so just they're the ones that uh, do us, that uh, fund us and support the work. I also want to mention at the very beginning the many graduate and undergraduate students, a lot of them in the back row, you'll see today, and some of them are looking for a job in May. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. But anyway, I want to talk about a, a, some changes in stormwater management I'm sure you're very aware of. One of the big changes that we've noticed is the fact that most rain falls in smaller storms. And so it's a big change over the last 15 years in design. So for an example, one of the ones that we always show is that if I get about one inch of rain, 50% of this rainfall falls in storms less than an inch. And if I capture the first inch of the bigger storms, we're jumping up to about 80%. So like in Philadelphia and Green in the city, they're looking at one inch of rain. It has to be completely removed in all new projects because the remainder goes to combined sewer overflows. So they're very interested in getting that first flood, that first inch from a water quality perspective. And frankly, most of the time, on any average year, which I've never seen in my life, an average year, <laughs> that we only get a, we don't, don't get very many storms bigger than an inch. So, I mean, in Philadelphia area, we usually get about six inches, greater than about one and a half inches a year. So, on an average year, the last couple of years have definitely not been average. And obviously things are changing. But anyway, so a lot of the focus you'll see here has been on the smaller storms. We have a whole bunch of sites. The first one you'll see, which is two stories up, is a green roof on this building. We're doing some research on. You'll hear about that from Dr. Wadzik a little bit later. We have I think 15 or 16 uh, bioinfiltration or swales or bioretention sites on campus, and I think that's actually a small number because they're doing some renovations to the interior of campus. And as part of that, for a permit, they've had to put in rain gardens. And I'll see three of them at least. No, we'll see five of them actually on a very short hour tour as we move along. Um, we have a whole bunch of porous concrete and porous asphalt sites. You know, here are some from uh, Dr. Uh, Welker talking about temperature effects and things like that. Uh, Dr. Kamos will be talking a little bit about some of the environmental properties a little bit later as well. So, and this one, I don't know if we're going to bother going by it because there's not much you can see, but that's an 1890s silkaway or infiltration pit that worked to the 70s until it was disconnected, not because it wasn't working, but just because we had to modernize. All right, so some of this stuff, we like to think of it as new, it's not really new. Um, we also have a stormwater wetlands we'll be stopping by. That was built on campus actually out of an old detention pond, uh, which is a very lovely site, and we're actually doing some valid transpiration studies near there as well. And we'll hear a little bit about that later. But anyway, a little history. I'm going to talk about my, one of my favorite projects, which is a rain garden. And these have been around since the 80s, which Seems like for some of you probably a long time ago, in terms of engineering technology and change, this is very recent. And when it first started off, this was a nice little idea where it's going to soak the water into the ground. Part of our work has been trying to turn this into a more scientific basis. So we know how much water it soaks in, what happens to the water, and what are the water quality processes moving along. So we're looking at this as a quote from one of my friends from Alan Davis. If we're going to be using this technology, for our control measures or as part of a watershed plan, we have to be smart about it. All right. um, and we have to go forward and understand the processes. So we've been doing a lot of research. Here's one more we'll visit. And basically, it takes the water off these roadways. And I'm going to try to give my colleagues some time. So I'm going to speed through this a little bit. But uh, we'll talk about it on the site. But it's been in the place since for the last 11 years with no change in the infiltration rates uh, built it. We just dug a hole in the ground, filled it with sandy soil that we mixed on site, and uh, taking a look at, we had to get water in, so we had some curb cuts and a pipe bringing the water in. We've done all sorts of instrumentations on the site uh, to basically uh, understand what's going on, and as I said, I'll talk about it a little bit in the past. A lot of people are saying, well, we need to have an underdrain. The problem is some of these underdrains 
reduce the flows, uh, reduce the storage time the flows go through a little too fast. So that's some of the thought process of putting it under drain is changing a little bit. Uh, now, what they're looking at is, a friend of mine from North Carolina likes to call this internal water storage, where I put a vertical pipe on the end of that under drain. And he says for four bucks more, then you're going to get slow down that flow so there's a chance to get cleaned and a chance for it to infiltrate into the ground instead of leaving. Of course, I'm very cheap. I got rid of the pipe as well. Fifteen of our sites, we don't have any pipes underneath. It just goes into the ground. And the infiltration rate is about quarter inch. Uh, oh, sorry. It's about somewhere about quarter inch to about 0.4 inches per hour. Very low infiltration rate. And it's been doing it for 11 years and it works very fine. Uh, when we take a look at any of our sites, we can look at a hydrologic balance and look at the amount of water we're removing. So the rainfall is in the blue, the inflow to the site is in green, and the outflow is in red. So you can see it's reduced about 50% of the flows leaving the site are reduced. But if I look at my small storms, we're getting about 86% of any storm less than about an inch and a half. So we, instead of having 70 events leaving the site a year, we probably have five or something like that. Laura will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we can take a look. Each storm is very different on infiltration rates, and a lot of it is a function of temperature. And if I take a look here, it's up to uh, 2012. We can take a look at my infiltration rates by the storms. They are variable, but it works. And the, another, and the nice thing about it is that, to me, it looks like my infiltration rates might be expanding a little bit instead of after 11 years of operation of minimal maintenance. That's pretty good news of these type of structures. Um, we can also take a look at not only the effect of volume reduction, about how it slows the water leaving. And so a lot of the excessive erosion flows, if you're worried about downstream erosion, now if you're just hooked up into a combined sewer, you're not really care about this, right? But if I'm worried about going into a stream system and erosion and sedimentation, it also decreases the length of time the streams are exposed to erosive flows. And we also can take a look, even this is a six inch storm, which this definitely was not designed for, we still get some uh, reduction uh, during that storm. Some people say, well, you know, green infrastructure, if you're only going to get rid of it two inches of volume, what's that impact on a major flood? Well, if I get 12 inches of rain instead of 14 inches of rain, that's a difference. So I definitely do think it has. It may need some help in doing the job, but it definitely does aid in reducing some of the impacts. Uh, we've also found very clearly if I remove 86% of my uh, volume for small storms, I'm now removing like 90% and 85% of my total suspended solids and total dissolved solids. First flushes are important, and that removal is pretty critical. Uh, fish need water. I do love this study. I want to get this research grant. Uh, and I'm going to delay questions 